Welcome back to the Anti-Meta Meta Club. As you know, the Gran Turismo movie has just released and there's kind of a movie tie-in. One of the time trials is the movie's GTR at the Red Bull Ring. You can see it's all movie branded and stuff like that. And this week's Daily Race C is also a group three race at the Red Bull Ring. And while the movie's GTR is really good, it actually isn't the Meta Car. And I found something else as our Anti-Meta Car. Let's get into it. It's hilarious that it's come to this, but it appears that the Group 3 Supra is the perfect anti-meta car of the week. It no longer has the ridiculous power it used to have, so it's not going to be head and shoulders above everything everywhere. However, it weighs a lot less now, it's better on the tires, and I personally think it handles even better. The Genesis and GTR seem to be very good, they seem to be the meta for this track, but I believe the Supra is actually just as good. I managed to get a 27.07, though I could definitely get a high 26 if I were to grind it out a little bit more. A few people did get it into the 26th, and I believe at this point I was the fourth fastest on the leaderboard. I was at 73rd overall, and as you can see, the Genesis is overwhelmingly the meta car. You'll definitely see a lot of other cars, but Genesis, GTR, those are the main cars for this week. If you want to be really fast here, you have to get really comfortable with absolutely pushing the limits of the track. I like to push all the way wide as far as I can on the green part, and right when we get to the 100 meter board ahead, that's when we break. Get all the way down to second gear and turn in at the 50 meter board. I probably actually slowed down too much here, but doing so allowed me to get on the throttle a little bit as we went over that high curb, which can help you balance the car out. You can straddle this yellow part of the curb, but if you go over it, or even if you just go barely almost over it, you're probably going to get a penalty. With the Supra, make sure you're shifting at about 85 to 90% of the digital tachometer. I don't actually like hitting this braking zone the way that I did, but in order to get a really, really good line going into this next corner, it's imperative that you start really wide. Brake right before you get to the 100 meter board, and we're going to try to keep a straight line straddling the curb as we go. The elevation change in this corner is really weird, so if you turn in too early, it can really, really unsettle your car. Notice how I'm coming fully off the brakes before upshifting to second and then getting on the throttle, trying to make sure I do not slide the tires whatsoever. With really tight corners and with any kind of elevation change, using too much of the brakes can really easily cause you to understeer, and that's got both, so be really careful with the brakes. This particular braking zone is incredibly difficult to get right if you are planning on going over the curbs. I have seen some people do it consistently, but I've never been able to do it consistently. I prefer just to brake on the normal part of the track. Brake right before the 100 meter board, and you can go up on the curb a little bit to get a wider entry. As you turn in, make sure that you're dipping down to first to get the car to rotate, and then start coming off the brakes earlier than I did. As you can see, I completely missed the apex, but I was able to get back up to third and then get solidly on the throttle for the exit. Completely missing the apex there probably cost me almost a full tenth. I am once again asking you to go all the way up on the curb and we're going to brake right before we get to the 50 meter board right here. Notice I'm going to go full brake for only a brief second and immediately start trail braking. You might also notice that I'm really playing around with my brake pressure and I did dip in a second just for a brief moment to get the car to rotate so I can hit the apex. Be careful as you get on the throttle because this is going downhill. You can understeer off the track and you can also oversteer pretty easily there. So just be careful in general. You can use the entirety of the red and white curbing, but make sure you're back within the bounds of the white line before it ends. I like to use this tire mark right here as a braking point. My goal is to turn in and brake sharply, but only keep it at about 50% pressure, then immediately come off it as I turn in, trying to focus on keeping up as much speed as I can, getting up on the curb and getting on the throttle really early. You can, once again, go all the way up on the red and white curb, but if you go any further than that, you'll either get sucked off into the sand, spin out, or get a penalty. Make sure you use all of the track width so you're not steering too much and slowing your car down. Once again, we're going to straddle the red and white curbing. We're going to look for this fence here on the left before the 50 meter board, and that is our breaking point. Be extra, extra careful with how you apply the throttle here. We're going to dip down to third gear to rotate, back up to fourth for the exit so we can keep up even more speed. But if you get on the throttle too hard, too quickly, or too soon, it's going to push you all the way off the track. Notice I'm barely within the limits. My braking reference is the triple white marks right here before the little yellow bumps on the left. Dip down to third and turn in at the second yellow bumps and we're going to try to hit this just like T1. Go over the yellow in the middle just a little bit and then gently back on the throttle tracking out as much as you can and of course get back on the track before you hit the grass. Short lap but not very easy, let's look at it in full speed. 
Like I said initially, one of the key points in this track and making sure that you can go as fast as you possibly can is really abusing the track limits. Go all the way past the curb, straddling the red and white part as much as you can, and then on the exit you do the exact same thing. For T1, if you go too far over that yellow bump, you're going to get a penalty and you can really easily get a penalty, so try not to push that one too much. Most of the time, especially during the race, what I'm going to do is break on the normal part of the track and then move myself up onto the curb rather than trying to straddle the curb. It is really beneficial to get a really wide entry into that corner, so whatever you can do, if that means that you have to straddle the curb, make it happen. The reason I don't do the same with this corner is because there's kind of a bump on the curbing, so I do move up onto it a little bit. I started turning in and trail braking too late there. You do want to start turning in a little bit earlier than you usually would because it's downhill and it's kind of deceptive. For whatever reason, the shape and the very nature of this corner makes a lot of people spin out here. So if you can master this corner and be consistent there, you're going to have a leg up on the competition. This fast left is usually faster than most people expect, and you can get on the throttle pretty early because these cars do continue turning as you get on the throttle. It's really easy to make a mistake on this section, so just be really patient with it until you're really, really confident with it. Using a higher gear here on exit makes it less likely that the nose is going to lift on throttle application, and since it's downhill, there's already a high chance of that, so it just kind of helps you ensure that you're not going to understeer off the track. Usually on a Sunday evening, I can figure out what the anti-meta car might be, but I actually had absolutely no clue leading into my Monday stream. If you follow my stream, you know that I take Tuesdays off from streaming so I can make these videos. And usually by Tuesday, it's just about assembling and editing the video. But this was actually a Tuesday evening when I did this race. So obviously I was way behind and that's why this video is coming out late. I'm sorry. I was very tired and I had a good reason to be. I was actually doing a Michelin sponsored stream to promote the movie. So if you haven't checked out my stream, now's the time. I had 10,400 people watching me at one point. And after looking at the stats, it turns out that 340,000 people stopped by my stream on Monday. That doesn't even make sense. Anyways, I'll stop plugging my stream. For the race, it turns out the Supra is really good. And I thought it was going to be the anti-meta car, but I had to make sure. And so on Tuesday evening, I did another one of these races. It ended up being the perfect test because there were so many Genesises every Genesises? Genesi? Gen... There are so many Jennies everywhere that it was going to be the perfect opportunity to test to see if this was actually a really good anti-meta car. After making that first mistake, I thought I was going to get swallowed up by traffic, but I was lucky enough that Lamar behind me didn't get a great exit either, and so I was safe for now. I've made the mistake of braking way too late, thinking that I was actually braking early, and because of the accordion effect of all of the different cars slowing down and then not really knowing when to get back on the throttle, with all the different people having different pace, well, as you can see, a lot of people paid the price for that, and I unfortunately lost a position to Lamar, who was really brave on the outside. I've talked about this in the past, but people who have a reputation for being clean drivers can sometimes become the victim of a really good pass, because if people can trust that you're not going to push them off track on the outside, they definitely have the ability to go faster than you, since they're taking a wider line, and Lamar took full advantage of that. That was really good by him. The race, however, was still young, and I had already taken a whole bunch of positions from people who spun out on that last corner. There are a few really important lessons that I want to talk about in this race, and one of the main ones is the penalty zone. As you can see, Boku had to serve his penalty, and he was being safe, not cutting in front of KTMS, and he was even staying safe, trying to make sure I had space. He was still giving me space, and I actually could have gone on the outside, but I wasn't sure if he was going to try to take his position, which he rightfully could. And unfortunately, that led to me running into him. When that happened, I don't know if he just wasn't expecting the speed, or if he just made a mistake in general, and it caused him to go all the way off. Luckily, I don't think he got a worse penalty from that, and I didn't take a penalty from bumping him before he went off, but I felt bad. Sorry, Boku. I think KTMS's penalty was actually just from going off the track slightly on the final corner, and mine was from going off on the exit of the very first corner. In order to make a pass here stick, you either need to be so far ahead that you can cut into the corner and take the outside position really, really quickly, or you're going to have to be on the outside. It's really, really difficult to pass on the inside if the other person outbreaks you, because without pushing them off, you're going to be at a huge disadvantage, not only just being really tight going through the corner, which can cause you to slip, but also that little bump on the very inside of the corner can also cause the car to really get unsettled. And it's just, it's a bad idea to pass on the inside unless you're absolutely certain that you can outbreak the people going into it. 
Like I said in the actual lap guide, it's really easy to get loose on that corner. Sploder unfortunately got loose and he was already wide, which gave him an extra second penalty. Instead of just the half second penalty, he got a full second because it considered him cutting on the exit of one corner and the entry to the next. A quick jump to the next lap, we are already to the bumper of King Ghidorah, and I'm actually including this. I wasn't going to initially, but I actually think it's really important. I'm not doing this to call out Slayers. Slayers, I love you. I'm sorry I'm including this, but this is one thing that you need to be really careful about on this track. When you enter the pits, make sure you signal, which I did, and also make sure you're looking for people to signal, because when you take this corner, it seems identical to someone not pitting, and I was trying to pit there. If that happens to you, you've got to make sure you just get back on the track. Don't try to go in the pits because if you do, if you cut that line at all, you're going to get three seconds and that's going to completely kill your race. Now, one of the reasons that I was comfortable showing this, like I said before, I don't want to call out slayers. These things happen. But if you do make a mistake, pulling over and just giving the position back is a really good way of apologizing to people. And the other big thing is, if you do watch my stream, you'll know that I punted Slayers something like two times every single race for a solid four or five hours. So honestly, I deserved that. I also wanted to show my pit entry. This was actually a little bit slow by my standards, but I made sure not to hit that outside line. As you can see, King Ghidorah did go over that line, and you'll notice that he gets a three second penalty. A lot of people slow down way too much, and even if you stick to the inside, People can still hit you even if they're trying to avoid you. So make sure you keep up good speed, but try to just stay tight as you're entering. As you can see, King Ghidorah got that penalty for crossing the entrance pit lines. I think it's a lot more important to focus on the exit ones because when you're exiting, if you just cross those lines, as you can see right there, I would have just run into KTMS. And so that's why people are getting a three second penalty on entrance or exit of the pits. And I actually still see people in groups curious why they're getting a six second penalty, and that is why. Gran Turismo didn't used to have that. In GT Sport, they didn't enforce it in the beginning of Gran Turismo 7, they didn't either. There is an update a little bit after the game was released, and I actually think it is a welcome addition. It's really unfortunate that it is a no holds barred, zero wiggle room, instant three second penalty for crossing whatsoever but i do think it's better than allowing people just to fly out of the pits and come all the way across i've seen a lot of terrible accidents because of that anyways we haven't talked much about the strategy but essentially what you want to do is run the softs as long as you possibly can if you're starting from the back and a lot of times even starting from the front you're going to want to use the medium tires first and if you do that, you're going to have to know how long you can go on the softs. I would suggest starting out by going probably a maximum of nine laps on the softs until you're 100% confident that you can make the tires last longer than that. I've actually pit on lap two with various cars, the Supra being one of them, the M6 being another one, and neither of those cars are really, really good on tires. But if you're very careful and you don't slide the tires, you can make them last a lot longer than you might think. I was rambling so much about tires that I completely missed the opportunity to talk about one of the best ways that you can pass the Jennies. The Genesis can be pretty difficult to exit cleanly with. There are a lot of corners where you can get pretty sideways, and if you do slide out like that, as you can see, you're going to lose a lot of momentum. If you wait slightly longer or if you're slightly more gentle on the throttle than you usually would, you might be slightly slower on corner exit. However, if the Genesis in front of you doesn't make a mistake and you went a little bit slower, the slipstream is going to help make up for that. If the Genesis makes a mistake, even if you're going a little bit slower than you usually would, it's still going to be faster than a car slipping out from making a throttle mistake like I just did on that last corner exit. So when you're following, be gentle on the throttle. It's also really important to be gentle on the throttle and to kind of change your lines, brake early, turn in a little bit early, and be wary of the fact that it's going to wear your tires a little bit more because you're not going to have as much downforce because of the dirty air generated by the car in front of you. People coming out of the pits are actually going to be especially vulnerable for a couple reasons. Firstly, tires will be cold. It takes about a lap, maybe two laps, depending on the tire compound, for tires to get fully up to operating temperature. And since they're going slower because they came out of the pits, it's going to be a lot harder for most people to estimate exactly when they should brake. And so people are going to make a lot of mistakes doing that. As you can see, I was able to get in front of Gardening Tool pretty easily. I immediately defended, but I'm not sure who they are. They gave me a nice bump, and that was that. Jumping to lap 9, 
positions two through four are directly ahead of me. And so I'm going to start trying to put on some moves, put on some pressure and try to do anything I can to start getting ahead. If I slow both of us down by trying to pass Lamar right here, I then can still use the slipstream from Mr. Zay J and the guy ahead of him in order to maintain my pace. Like I said before, having the outside as long as you trust the person is advantageous because it's really difficult to get traction coming out of that corner if you've got a really tight line. And just like I said would happen, I was able to use the slipstream, move over to defend, and that was pretty much all it. I had taken tires a full lap later than most people, so my tires were doing really well, and I had a much better position going into that corner. So then when I got out of it with that really good exit compared to Lamar and I was in the slipstream of Mr. Zay J, I didn't really have too much to worry about. It's taken another couple laps, but I'm now in a position where I can start trying to make moves on Mr. Zay J. He's had really good pace along with GT7 player. And right there, he made the fatal mistake of getting on the throttle too hard on that exit curbing, just like I did a few laps before. Unlike more realistic and hardcore Sims, there's ghosting in Gran Turismo, and he had already completely lost it. There's nothing he could have done to save that, so I just kept my foot in it. I always feel bad when something like that happens, but if I had just let off, both of our race would have been ruined, but since I stayed on it, only his race was ruined. So, sorry to him, but I'm glad that I made it through. After the incident with ZJ, it's taken me all the way to the final lap to get close enough to GT7 player to start making any moves. This is a perfect example of why I chose the Supra as the anti-meta car. The Genesis is so fast that a lot of cars, even within the slipstream that close, still can't pass the Genesis, but the Supra still has enough power to make a move. Assuming GT7 player was going to take the line like he rightfully should, I was going to try to pull off the switcheroo, but like I've been talking about, that little bump made it so I couldn't quite get traction, so again, I was on his bumper. When it comes to situations like this, I often put on a move every single corner until something happens, until something gives. Even if it slows us down, Slayers is still 1.4 seconds behind, the race is almost over, so doing anything you can can really benefit, and I was able to pull off that outside move, trusting that GT7 wasn't going to push me off, and I was really lucky that he wasn't that kind of guy. So thank you, GT7 player. With that said, if you see the rear view, that corner, like I keep saying, is really dangerous, and unfortunately, he took out Slayers because he slid across the grass. I ended up in second place, and Slayers actually apologized again, saying that he thought I would have had the move if not for that mistake. What's really funny is, with Rad nearly six seconds ahead, I don't think it made any difference whatsoever. In fact, had he not hit me there, we would have both been in different positions, and we might not have been able to get so far ahead, and I might not have got second place. So, Slayers, you might have actually given me second place there. So thanks, bud. As always, thank you very much for watching my video. If you haven't done it already, please like and subscribe, share it with all your friends, all that good stuff. And of course, I'll be back next week with another episode of the Anti-Meta Meta Club.